I'm wondering if you are asking yourselves, why are we saved when we are going to read the Word of God? Well, we just read the Gospel lesson, and the lesson for today, the sermon for today, is going to be on the Old Testament. So uh, that's why we are doing things a little bit different today. And our uh, lesson for today comes from the book of Isaiah, uh, chapter 55, verses 1 through 9. This is what the Word of God says. How everyone thirsts. Come to the waters, and you that have no money, come, buy, and eat. Come, buy wine and milk, without money and without price. Why do you spend your money for that which is not bread, and your labor for what that which does not satisfy? Listen carefully to me, and eat what is good and delight yourselves in rich food. Incline your ear and come to me. Listen so that you may live. I will make with you an everlasting covenant by a steadfast, sure love for David. See, I made him a witness to the peoples, a leader and commander for the peoples. See? You shall call nations that you do not know, and nations that you do not know that do not know you shall run to you. Because of the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, He has glorified you. Seek the Lord while He may be found. Call upon Him while He is near. Let the weak forsake their way, and the unrighteous their thoughts. Let them return to the Lord, that, they, that He may have mercy on them, and to our God, for He will abundantly pardon. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. This is the word of God for the people of God. How oh, everyone who thirsts, come to the water, and you that have no money, come buy and eat. I wonder if there is one person here, just one person in this room, who have not felt thirst or hunger, at least one in their life. Think about that moment or moments in which you felt deprived for whatever reason, or from one or perhaps both of the most fundamental items needed by any creature to remain alive. Do you remember how you felt? Did it ever cross your mind at that very moment to think of the severe consequences of going without water or food for a lengthy period of time? According to UNICEF, women and girls around the world spend close to 200 million hours a day. 200 million hours a day collecting water. In a far Ethiopia, for the 13-year-old named Ayesha, her journey to bring water for herself and her family <coughs> takes eight hours each day. In a refugee camp in South Sudan, the average meal supply that the UN World Food Program is made out of eight, six and a half ounces of a mixture of wheat, beans or peas, corn, soy, and salt. That meal provides the equivalent of 700 calories, just enough to remain alive. The feelings for those suffering of famine and displacement will be oppressive, despair, hopelessness, uncertainty is what fill up the camps. Now, perhaps if you look at these numbers in perspective, most likely neither you nor I have ever suffered of a real physical thirst or hunger. We are absolutely pri privileged to have, for the most part, our basic needs covered. 
So if we haven't been there, how can we get a real hold of what the Lord is saying through the servant Isaiah? The writer of the book of Isaiah is writing to the people of Israel, which is about to return to their land after 70 years in exile, to Babylon first, later in Persia. They have suffered enormously. They have been, they have been enslaved, oppressed by tyrants. Their freedom has been taken away from them. They have lost their roots and have assimilated themselves into the cultures of the lands to which they have been forcibly moved. Many of their cultural traditions and religious beliefs have been, are now diffused just as memories. Israel has lost its identity. Despair, hopelessness, and uncertainty fill their, fill their life. Israel doesn't know what waits for them when they return to their land. The people is thirsty for hope and hungry for freedom and restoration. They are afraid that God has condemned them. So God uses these images, the ones we just read about. This metaphor that bear the human longing for the most basic things in life with Israel's stress, loneliness, and anxiety. This invitation to drink from the living waters and to be filled with the bread of life is not an isolated event. This invitation is not only made for, to help Israel in that specific moment in history. This is an open-ended invitation with an everlasting purpose. God advises the people to listen carefully, to incline their ear and come to Him. Hearken, and you shall be revived, God says. Listen, come to me, you shall be restored. I will make with you an everlasting covenant. There are no, these are not words that have a superficial meaning. This is a redeeming, restoring life giving promise coming out from the Most High, the Creator, the Sustainer, the Sustainer of life. Most importantly, this is an invitation open to all the people. The promise of this covenant is made to all people, not just to a few elected. Ho, all who are thirsty and hungry. <coughs> Everyone who is in distress, or who is hopeless, anyone suffering from their rejection, abuse, uncertainty, discrimination, you there, battling with mental illness, depression, substance abuse, you broken human being, for you, come to the water. Buy food without cost, the Lord says. Listen and come to me, to the living waters that give life, Come to me and eat the bread that tortures. Fast forward 2,700 years. We look around and see over and over again similar thirstlessness and hunger. We have been told by this society that one's goal in life is to pursue the pursuit of happiness. And such happiness is most of the time associated with material things. In an article I read this week in the Washington Post, one of the authors of the famous World Happiness Report states that, by most accounts, Americans should be happier now than ever. However, the evidence points that just because we are wealthier and the standard of living improves, it doesn't mean that happiness follows. Addictions are causing considerable unhappiness and depression in the U.S., another report cited by the Washington Post states. Our compulsive pursuit of substance abuse and addictive behaviors have led us to become a mass addiction society. We are thirsty and hungry for reaching an unnatural, synthetic state of mind and emotion. We are falling prey to that trap that is set to enslave us. Yes, we don't need to walk eight hours a day to get water. 
nor we can only eat enough to survive. And yet, our despair is so overwhelming that we continue to seek to quench our thirst drinking from the wrong, from, from the wrong fountain. We continue in poison bread to satiate our appetite. In our pursuit for fall, unfulfilling happiness, we, as a society, have turned to man-made gods that are dragging us into darkness that lead to brokenness, desperation, and death. That is a grim, depressing picture, isn't it? Earlier this week, during the lunch break here at church, Ron Johnson asked, me, asked us this point, point of question. Do you think that there are people who live without hope? My answer was yes. I have seen people who live without any hope. I told Ron that several years ago, during a mission trip to India to work in an orphanage, I was appalled when I looked into the eyes of, people, of the people on the streets and I couldn't see any spark of hope in them. Then, whenever we went back to the orphanage to work with the children there, their demeanor was a complete opposite to what we saw in the streets. At that point, I understood what made the children hope. They were drinking from the living waters of the Word of God. They were heeding to the promise of a new life proclaimed by the Almighty, <clears throat> and their broken little lives had been restored. Yes, I have seen people live in no hope. But I also, I have also witnessed what the living waters can do. They restore, they heal, they bring back life. But for those children to be nurtured with the bread of life, followers of Jesus Christ have to step up and be willing to become the vessels that the Lord will use to bring God's grace and mercy upon their lives. Like in the case of the children, thousands of miles away, in the darkest hours of my own life, someone accepted God's calling to show me that even for me, there was a promise of restoration and transformation, a promise of a new life. Every day in my life, I thank God for His mercy. Very recently, a friend of mine called me on the phone. He was profoundly concerned about the emotional health of his family that he met that very morning. I told him to give his family my phone number and to tell them that I was willing to meet with them whenever they felt comfortable. That same evening, I received a message from the mother of his family invited me to visit with them the next day. This is their story. Juan and Maria have four daughters. The oldest, 10 year old Guadalupe, was the most vivacious, caring, loving child. But Guadalupe was born with spinal bifida. Even though her special needs, Guadalupe live a normal life as much as she could. And that very day, when that, that, that day, after a normal day, Guadalupe told her, told her parents that perhaps she was getting a cold because she had a headache and she was developing some fever. Maria and Juan took Guadalupe to the hospital. It was a cold Sunday, Sunday evening. Within a few minutes of being in the emergency room, Guadalupe became upset and distressed. A couple of hours later, she was comatose. The next day, this little angel passed away. I arrived to their home. I found an utterly devastated mother. Her sorrow, pain, and grief were indescribable. I cannot fathom how much pain was going through this mother's heart. Like Israel, she thought that God had abandoned her and her family. We talked and talked 
where the three surviving little ones playfully roam around the tiny living room unaware of what was happening. Slowly, Mom became more calm and serene. At that point, I realized that once again, God said the fountain of, that provides living water had touched her smashed heart and was pouring his grace and compassion upon Maria. He was really a glorious one for him to serve. It amazes me that God always uses any life situation to call our attention about the truly nature and about the death of his covenant with humankind, with you and me. That covenant knows no specific time in history. That covenant is not aimed to a particular group of people. In God's sight, we are, there is no chosen people. We are all from Israel. Every day, you and I have the opportunity to encounter someone who is so thirsty or so hungry that they feel that it's not possible, or even it's not possible. Everywhere there is a broken, despair, desolated human being, desperately looking for water to drink or bread to eat. Listen carefully, friends, because God may want to use you as the vessel that quench their thirst. God may want to bring the bread of hope to those people through you. You don't need to worry about how unprepared you feel for the patient. Allow God to use you as the vessel that contains abundant life. Always remember that God plans and not your plans. And His ways are not your ways. Now you have heard. Hearken to Him. Become God's instrument. When my children were little, they used to keep me to my work. And frequently they told me, Hey, Dad, a promise is a promise. So I had the choice that to fulfill the promise, whatever it was. Today, I tell you, a covenant is a covenant. God is honoring God's part, going to the world, and honoring the Lord. Amen. <laughs>